Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We're continuing on with our recollection ser- series, the historical series this off season. We'll be doing talking about some of the uh, perhaps forgotten to some degree players or prior to a lot of people who are listening to this show, their their interest in football. So uh, today we're going to talk about Kadri Ishmael. Joining me to do that is you, Cole. You, how you doing? I'm good, Ken. Thanks. How are you? Uh, great having you on again. You, we, we actually recorded an episode that I'm really looking forward to people's reaction to on Jackson and Manning that will probably air before this Recollections pod does. So go back, look for it in the thing. Uh, I think it's an excellent comparison of the careers of Lamar Jackson and Peyton Manning in terms of of uh, how things went along, what advantages and disadvantages they had, and going in. It. And I, I really enjoyed recording that with you. But today Thanks. we're going to talk about Kadri Ashmael. And I, you picked the player. Tell me, why was he a guy you wanted to talk about? I mean, one of my favorite things about you know sports in general, but I think football players in particular are the comeback guys, the guys that you know uh, face adversity at some point in their career and are able to um, to con- come and find an, a second or sometimes even a third opportunity and resuscitate their career. There even seem to find a lot of guys like that. Um, but Kadri was one of those guys. I mean, as we talked about a few minutes ago, he came in off a couple of really bad years uh, after some decent years in Minnesota and then just found something with the Ravens and uh, had, you know, three years here that, you know, included one of the best uh, in Ravens history. It's certainly a, uh, a, a great run. It's interesting. He, his, his years didn't always exactly coincide with when the Ravens were great. He, he had his down year as a receiver in 2000 when the Ravens were great. Uh, there's a lot, so many things about Kadri Ishmael that are, that are interesting. Of course, he holds the all-time receiving record uh, in a game for the Ravens. There's, there's a Raven with 258 yards receiving in a game. A lot of people don't know this, but it was in the 31-24 win at Pittsburgh in 1999. What I really love about that time was that the, the the Ravens became the 2000 Ravens, essentially for me, during that four-game winning streak at the end of 1999. They they played some dominant freaking football. They had their first shutout ever of Cincinnati, um, and, and they won four straight games, including one of the most lopsided wins and impressive wins in team history, the 41-14 to win over the Titans, who would end up being coming up just a yard short of the Super Bowl. So uh, a very cool stretch for the Ravens, and that included this this big game from Kadri. Yeah, he de- he definitely uh, found something with Tony Banks at the end of that '99 season that that um, didn't uh, you know started to carry over into the 2000 season at the beginning. Obviously, Banks didn't finish that 2000 season, but he and uh, he and Ishmael found something late in that '99 season, and then Kadri, you know, seemed to to carry it through. Had a pretty decent uh, relationship with Dilfer as well. You know, you, you mentioned now two guys uh, that, that that threw to Kadri during his career. And Kadri did not have great fortune to either play with Flacco, as Torrey Smith did, or play with Jackson, as any number of backs and receivers have who've, who've had success. The quarterbacks he played with, and I think this is the, the complete list, but I might have, uh, I could I could think of one other that maybe should be on this list too. But uh, Scott Mitchell, the water buffalo, Stony Case, mm-hmm. who, uh, you know, I remember the Stone Age was going to start during that 1999 season. It ended very quickly as well. It was a very brief age. Uh, Tony Banks, of course, came in and was was good for about one full season, end of 99 and, and beginning of 2000. His, his total play was pretty decent. And then Trent Dilfer, mm-hmm. um, Elvis Gerback, and Randall mm-hmm. Cunningham. That's right. Not a great set of quarterbacks he had to work with. And you can add Chris Redman to that list, who I think threw three passes in 2001 or something. Um, but anyway, n- not a great set of quarterbacks. I tried very hard to find a Chris Redman to Kadri Ishmael pass, and I couldn't seem to find it. So maybe someone else out there knows something that I don't. But um, but he, yeah, you're right. He And it wasn't always what was interesting. Uh, one of the things that was interesting was it wasn't always in succession. There were times where it would be, you know, Mitchell for a couple games and then Case for a couple games and then Mitchell and then back to Banks. And it was just sort of, it seemed like it was kind of all over the place. Yeah. I mean, it's if you want to talk about continuity between receivers and, and quarterbacks, he, did, he never had it for a full season in three years. And yet he piled up some really terrific numbers with the Ravens, uh, two 1,000-yard seasons. I think that's true, two 1,000-yard seasons. And uh, another 600 and change during the Super Bowl year um, when he still was good and and certainly was was making plays for the Ravens, but he, he just didn't have the total yardage. A lot of the offense was was running through Shannon Sharp. Yeah, he had 11.05 in 99. He had 10.59 again 
in 2001. Uh, catch rate was never all that high with the Ravens, only sitting at about a 45 point, uh, sorry, a 52% catch rate for his Ravens career. He was a, uh, he was not always a huge yard per target guy. I think eight something yeah. was, in the low eights was kind of his, his career seven, number. Yeah. Seven, 7.9 okay, uh, with the Ravens, 7.6 <laughs> for his career. So you're right. He wasn't a yards per target guy. And the catch rate was the reason for that because his yards per reception were pretty good all the way through. Uh, he had one year of 18.7 at Minnesota when he did have 11.1 yards per target. Uh, uh, that was on a relatively small number of targets on 54. But I guess I think Billick was with them in 95 as some member of the offensive staff. I don't know when he became offensive coordinator, but it, that he was offensive coordinator, obviously, before he came to the Ravens in, in 99. Yeah, I think he was on the I think I saw he was on the uh, staff that drafted uh, Ishmael to Minnesota that year. Um a lot of the uh, a lot of those big plays um, that uh, you mentioned a second ago were um, were just sort of contested catch, throw it up. You know, you, there's there's plenty of highlights of Kadri Ishmael where you, you know between especially between Banks and Dilfer where they're throwing off their bat back foot, heaving it, and he's just going up and getting it. Um, and that was one of the things I, that I was most remember about him was his big playability, but a lot of big plays on. Uh, contested catches. Um, and in a way, you know, it was funny because some of the highlight packages I saw, they would include a number of um, sort of Odell Beckham like uh, pass interference penalties that he was able to draw away down the field. So he sort of had a knack for sort of producing contact and getting those calls. Yeah, I, I'm going to just put out a request right now that that not be the language we use for those Odell Beckham like pass interference calls, unless you're talking about ones where he dekes the official into making the wrong flag. I, I, I want to call them Tory Smith type pass interference calls because that guy was the master. Fair in enough. So just yeah. just too much speed for his. Uh, yeah, uh, but Cadre, uh, uh, a, a hell of a player. I, I liked the way he often did not get distracted by the defender's hands. And I remember a particular catch, I think it was against Dallas in the 27 and nothing win. Not a big play in terms of the individual game, although it might have been the one that put the Ravens up seven to nothing. But anyway, it, it was it was in that game. The ball went directly through the hands of the of the uh, Dallas defender. And usually that's enough to get the receiver to, to, to drop the ball. And Ishmael also had to worry about his feet on that play and staying in bounds. Uh, just a really impressive catch. I think I have the game right if you go back there. And that that game has been on and off YouTube and available. I've got it in my collection, but it's but it's it's one of those things that's it's a really great game to watch if you want to watch offensive line play. And John Madden, for the first time, was coming to Baltimore to do that 4 p.m. game that they would do on Sundays. And... He, he really was having a great day telestrating Ogden and Mulatalo just crumbling that Dallas defense that Jamal Lewis had a, had a really big game. It's, it's, a, it's a great game if you can see it. Uh, probably the greatest game of Ogden's career in terms of just a, a whole number of highlight blocks. Uh, you'll never see anything like that uh, you know, for a player again. Mulatalo also had gone to high school with John Madden, and so they, they, he, he really was enjoying telestrating his play that day. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk on a cadre. Other things from his playing career. I want to get to the individual notes, but also want to mention about his broadcasting career. And I always appreciated his his stuff on the um, on the uh, preseason games. Well, he certainly seemed uh, to display during his uh, during his playing career that sort of personality, the smile, just the energy that um, that would um, certainly translate into the into the post career, uh, you know, commentating side of things. I mean, as we all know, that team in the late '90s, early 2000s had a lot of personalities on it, mm-hmm. and so to be able to, to to sort of hold your own and stand out uh, as a personality yourself was uh, was was not a, a small feat. So he certainly did that. I can think of at least four guys, and I, I may be way short on this, but Rod Woodson, of course, still doing games today, and he's terrific, great analyst. Uh, Tony Saragusa, of course, RIP, but but uh, he was on the sideline. He always had a special deal with Fox that he didn't have to wait for the announcers to 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 ask to call for him, so he didn't have a red button. He was pushing to say, "I've got something to say." Just to, just talk. <laughs> Which I always really loved about his yeah. special deal. Um, Obafemi Ian Badejo went back on a business degree. There's some analytics ability that's clearly present with Femi uh, that I really like in his broadcasting style. 
and then I'm missing somebody because I thought of four and cut and Q. Yeah. And yeah. he he's in those preseason games. So I'm trying to think who else from that team, whether Bullwear had done any any broadcasting or you can kind uh, of count Ray Lewis, I suppose, as he's does sort of spots for NFL network and that kind of stuff. And Shannon Sharp, I guess, is on with Skip Bayless. So you yep. can't can't forget him. So yep. uh it's a it's an impressive group. Has Trent Dilfer ever done anything? Because I think he was on briefly. Or something. I know this. We've we've seen some bitterness over the years from Trent about you know what happened here in Baltimore. But uh, I, I one thing about hey guys, I want to tell you about the Eufy Video Lock because when I'm not podcasting, I am my day job is a smart home specialist, and the Eufy Video Smart Lock is perfect. This is what you guys need to go get. It replaces the deadbolt on your door, so now you can come home without fumbling with keys. You can just type in a code or even better, use your fingerprint to unlock. After one second, you put your finger there, pops out, my door's open. It's perfect. It also is an integrated video doorbell. We've all seen the video doorbells. We all know the ones that are out there. I've seen many of them get stolen. No one's going to steal this because it's your door lock. It's impossible for them to steal. There's no monthly fee. Other ones do. But this one, it'll record locally, so you never have to pay if you don't want to. The battery, it lasts up to four months. Plus, it notifies you ahead of time. And I mentioned earlier one-second fingerprint recognition. No, I meant one second till it opens. The AI self-learning chip will learn your fingerprint even faster, and then it opens up. Completely keyless entry. No more keys. And... I know I set this up as I'm a smart home specialist, but anyone can install this. All you need is a Phillips screwdriver. That's it. And then you're done. Guys, I love this product. Make sure you check it out. Now, here's the easiest thing to do. Just go on on to Google or whatever you prefer and search Eufy Video Lock. That's E-U-F-Y Video Lock. Or visit eufyofficial.com forward slash video lock to see how you can gain complete control of your door, just like me, just like Ken. And I just want to tell the story. I was at an autograph show. It's got to be a decade ago now. And and uh, Trent Dilfer was there. I got to say, biggest class act you'll ever see. He had his Super Bowl ring with him because he thought that's something people want to see. He's taking pictures with people with it. He's letting kids wear his ring. I mean, just it was it was a it was a very cool thing for him to be the kind of, of personality he was there. And you know, you, you hear some of the little things, and obviously seeing what happened in two thousand one. He's probably thinking to himself, I could have done that. <laughs> you know, if they yeah. just give me the money for I could have done it for less money. <laughs> but uh uh anyway, uh interesting story will always be the greatest backup quarterback in Ravens history. Yeah. Uh and you know, you could throw Billick in there, obviously not a player, but the coach of the team and no, has done a point. lot of a lot of uh work on the on the TV side since. What a what a group. What a group that they uh they they did all that. Uh, let's see what else we got to talk. How about some individual plays that you remember from Cadre's career? Um, well, I think, you know, play wise, as I mentioned, a lot of contested catch type stuff, a lot of, uh, you know, the, the one that stands out from the Steelers game that you mentioned earlier was the first one where he, uh, it was a long, uh, play down the left side of the field. I believe that he, uh, that he caught, got hit, uh, didn't seem like it was a terrible hit, but it was one where he, he scored and then collapsed in the end zone and was down for a number of minutes while they yeah. uh, they tended to him. Um, and again, it didn't look like a crushing blow, but he must have just got him, the the defender must have just got him right in the right spot. Yeah, I I, I remember that the other, the the Steelers defender. I remember having a lot of trouble. And it was a was a safety I think called Steve Shields or his name was Shields anyway. And he had a lot of trouble with him that day. Just could not stay with him. And yeah. and uh, Banks kept finding him. Kept you know it was a. Uh, no problem. He had six catches that day and and had touchdown pat catches of 54, 59, and 76. And if you're an early Ravens fan, the only guy who had that kind of explosive big play ability was Jermaine Lewis. Uh, you know, he was the guy who who had a, piled up the 50 plus yard plays during his Ravens career. Yeah. And uh, and Connery really not not known for that back then, but he ended up having a few in his career. He did. Interestingly, uh, six catches for Ishmael on eight completions by Banks in that game. So it was a huge uh, 
portion, huge portion of their passing offense, obviously. So he came back the very next week and put 115 yards on the on the board against New Orleans. And I, again, this is during that four game winning streak that kind of defines the beginning of Ravens history. It starts actually with that Titans game and continues on with the Steelers, then the Saints, and then the first shutout ever against the Bengals. But in the in the uh, that game brought him up to 500 for the latest time ever in a season. Now, Ravens fans are incredibly spoiled right now and won't think that's any big deal. At that time, it was a big deal. To be 7-7 seven and seven after 14 weeks, or for, after 14 games, I should say, was a very big deal in 1999. Have a chance that the first winning season was was out there, and they, they ended up not getting it because of a loss to New England on the final uh, uh, Sunday, which didn't seem as bad the next year when New England won the, uh, won the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, a couple other things about that game. Um, I believe that was the first Ravens win in Pittsburgh that uh, in that ninety nine, that ninety nine season. Um, I think there's a, there's a some video of him sort of you know uh, championing that or or, or touting that um, on the sideline. Um, Sure, you'll, you'll, you or someone else will correct me if I'm he's, wrong about that. But. Well, he's he's quite the historian then, because I remember he did the same thing for the Titans when they had the first win ever at Adelphia, and it was the first win by anybody mm-hmm. at Adelphia, not not the. And this was in the, the in the waning days of Three Rivers Stadium, because the very next year they came in and they and they really knocked the crap out of the Steelers, sixteen to nothing on opening day in the last finale there, which is great. Always always good to end a building with a with a smile for yeah. the, for the Ravens here. Uh, and he had the only touchdown for Banks in that game too. Another fifty-three yard play. Uh, so he was kind of was a Steelers killer during his career. He was, which is all you know, something you always want to see in a Raven, right? Yeah. Other plays that come to mind. Um, one that stood out to me, and I think partially because of something we talked about earlier, but um, a uh, a game winning uh, touchdown catch in the 01 season um so it's sort of later in his time with the ravens sort of middle of the season i think it was week 7 um but he uh caught a touchdown pass from um from um Randall from Cunningham. Randall from yeah. Randall Cunningham yeah so um to to win a, it was an 18-17 win over um over the jags again nice team to beat if you're a ravens fan um but i just i you know i i i can't quite get over the fact that he caught passes from six different quarterbacks over a three-year period. Um, and that was just one that was just kind of, had, I had forgotten about, but I enjoyed watching because it was two guys that I, you know, one guy I really liked and one guy I'd forgotten quite honestly was a Raven, Randall Cunningham. Yep. Yeah. He's, Randall Cunningham and, and Elvis Gerback had some back and forth battles for that starting role. And um, it, honestly, Billick wasn't committing to either one of them, but uh, he had Randall Cunningham came in in relief for him a fair amount. Uh, he would go with the hot hand, and in this particular game, unbelievable body contortion play because this was another one where where Ishmael had to be very concerned about it, where his feet were as he came down with the football, so he had to secure it, get his feet down. The, the play was actually reviewed. Um, after the toe tap and upheld, so uh, huge win. They didn't get the two point conversion. They still had to. Weird game because they not only did they um, did they eventually they immediately gave gave uh, the Jacks a a chance of the ball and they got him out finally after about an eight play drive. Then they got the ball again and they kneeled it three straight times when that didn't get them to the end of the clock and only got them to about twenty seconds left. But their punter, who was Kyle Richardson at the time, only had a seventeen yard punt that gave Jacksonville yet another chance to get in field goal range. And the Ravens had to stop him again. It was only about three plays, but they but they ended up uh, uh, getting him off the field and uh, and finish the game. All right, I've got one other, and that's the game, uh, the touchdown from Gerback against the Titans um, in the eleven twelve oh one game. Now I have mentioned this on other pods, but eleven twelve that's the date you want to see the Ravens playing at Adelphia. They've had three games on exactly that date in history, and the three are three of the most exciting games, and, and you'll remember every one of them. But the in 11-12 of 2000, they went and dealt the Titans the first ever loss um, at Adelphia, 24-23. The next year, they went and won 16-10 on a game that was decided at the one-yard line on a play after time had fully expired, but a defensive foul had occurred. Peter Boulware was off sides, and uh, Sharper and Harris – stopped McNair on a quarterback sneak uh, on fourth down. So that won that game. And then on 11-12 of 06, they won on Trevor Price's blocked field goal 
at the end of the game. And again, they came back from a 26 to seven deficit. So um, that's the date. If you, if you see the, the Titans on the schedule and they're playing 11, 12, you know, then the league is not, um, has not dealt with the curse that, that the Titans are probably asking not to play on that day, but, uh, but very, very fun. Then, and, and, and incredible that, that that would happen three times on the same day. All right. Uh, any, anything else before we log off here? For uh, there, there was one more. There was a, a uh, in, in the 01 season against Indianapolis. Uh, he caught a touchdown to put him ahead in the fourth quarter, uh, sort of week 12. Um, and that was one just a, a back and forth game. Um, Gerback, uh, you know, Gerback to, to Ishmael for, for the touchdown. Um, always like to beat Indianapolis. It was one where um, Matt Stover had a bunch of field goals. Uh, you're, you know, the guys you previously mentioned, Ian Badejo, I think, had two touchdowns mm-hmm. in that game. Uh, Ishmael had one. Rod Woodson had an interception return at the end to ice it. Um, but one that just sort of, I think, put a uh, a bit of a, a punctuation mark on on Ishmael's career because he would leave uh, leave the next year. Yeah. Oh, a great uh, a great three year run here with the Ravens. I think you know, based on what happened after he left the team. Uh, he just played one more year for Indianapolis, and he wasn't terrible or anything. But but he, you know he had 462 yards receiving in 2002, and then that was the end of the line for him. Uh, the Ravens, as many players that we've been talking about here, really sucked the cream off his career. He wasn't a particularly great player at Minnesota, though he had his moments. He had, came to Baltimore, had three great years, and he left, and he was basically done. And you, you can't do much better than that, and really kind of shows that the Ravens have been good about finding the undervalued player and letting him go when he, when he gets out of their value range. There is something in the DNA that just allows them to find guys like Clowney Van Noy this past year and, and going all the way back to their, to the beginnings that just uh, gets these guys to, you know, add a couple percentage points to the, uh, to the ability. Yeah, there you are. All right. Really appreciate talking about this with you. You tell folks where they can talk football with you online. I'm not on Twitter a ton, but I am uh, on there every once in a while uh, at Hugh Cole. Uh, it's probably the best way to reach me. DM me there or just uh, you know include me in a comment. All right. Other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a recollection show and uh, have a favorite Raven you'd like to talk about, hit me up. The ends are always open on Twitter and I will uh, respond to you very quickly and get you on the schedule. Uh, but re- I'm really enjoying this this uh, series in general and, and meeting some new folks. You is, a, is somebody I, I met for the first time here and, and uh, this is a, a lot of fun. Uh, you, thanks again for coming on. Thank you. And we'll talk to you next time on Film Study.